Welcome back, students. In the past dozen lectures or so, we have been working with databases and the Qt SQL module, and we built some pretty powerful applications using what I call the standard method of working with databases. That entails writing a SQL query, looping through the results, and manually writing the code to populate a Qt widget with data from the database. And any modifications we wanted to make required an insert, update, or delete SQL query created with user input into a Qt widget. And this method works. It's very good to know. I think to me it's very intuitive. And it probably is for most other programmers as well. And I should add that you can use any Python database module to access the database with this method. You don't necessarily need to use the Qt SQL module for that. But I also said that there was another way that can be more efficient, although not so intuitive to most programmers. And this is known as a model view controller programming paradigm. And this does require the use of the Qt SQL module. I think it's a bit uncomfortable to many programmers because it seems kind of like a black box approach. And if they have problems, they don't know how to fix them because they don't understand what goes on inside the black box. But I think if you do take the time to understand it, it can be more efficient. I think it's more commonly used with professional programmers. Now, we've already discussed some basic concepts about the model view controller programming paradigm way back in lecture 54. So you might want to go back and review that lecture. The basic takeaway, however, was that the point of the model view controller architecture is to separate the functionality of the data source or model from the user interface or the view. And in the Qt world, the controller, which allows for interaction between the model and the view, is included with the view classes. So in the Qt world, you'll often see this referred to as model view architecture. We have already worked with several types of views in this course. I mentioned that QList widget is descended from QList view, and that likewise, QTree widget is descended from QTree view and QTable widget is descended from QTable view. And while the QList view, QTree view, and QTable view classes are intended to work with a model, the widget forms of these classes allow users to add, modify, and remove items directly without the complexity of a model. And that is what we've been working with so far in this course. But make no mistake about it, these widget classes use something called the Q standard item model behind the scenes. We're still working with models when we add an item to a Q list widget or a Q table widget. We're adding those items to the Q standard item model. But the Q standard item model is hidden from us, and so we don't really have to know anything about it to use it. The Q abstract item view class is the base class for all model based widgets. These again are the ones that end with the word view. The Q abstract item view class has a set model method that you use to specify the model to use with this view widget. And it has some signals as well, such as the activated clicked and double clicked signals. And we're talking a bit more detail about the Q abstract item view class in a bit. But I think we all have an idea of what these views look like. They are provided to us as part of the Qt framework, although we can create our own as well by subclassing the Q abstract item view class. But that is beyond the scope of this course. But what do we mean when we talk about a data model? What are they? Where do they come from? And how can we get one? A model provides access to data in an organized fashion. In the Qt framework, a data model can be thought of as a grid. Each model item has a row, a column, and a parent. If you think about it, a QList widget has rows, a QTable widget has rows and columns, and a QTree widget has rows, columns, and parents. So you can start to see how this data model framework can be used to populate these types of widgets. And each data item in a model can be referred to by its index. If you know the row, column, and parent, you can find the index of any item of data in the model. 
The Qt framework has a QModel index class that's used for references to individual data items. And we'll talk about this also in a bit more detail later. In the Qt framework, the base class for our data models is the Q abstract item model. If you think about it, we also had Q abstract item view as the base class for view based widgets. So we're keeping with the core idea of keeping the view and the model separate and independent. You can create your own data models by subclassing the Q abstract item model and we implementing some of its methods, signals, and slots to change how it works if you need to. That's beyond the scope of this course, but you should at least know that it's possible. Fortunately, the Qt framework includes some standard data models that descend from the Qt abstract item model. The Q standard item model allows you to add and remove text items to a model manually. I've never actually used this directly, but it's important because it's what the widget forms of Qt views use in the background. When you add, change, or remove an item in one of the widget classes, you're actually modifying the Q standard item model that these classes use. The Q file system model is an easy to use model that includes an file names, type sizes, etc. from the file system on your computer. And we'll see some examples of how to use this very soon. The Q abstract table model is the base class for a number of models that provide access to data in a database. The QSQL query model is a direct descendant of Q abstract query model that provides read-only access to a data model based on a SQL select query. We haven't discussed this much in this course, but a select query can include derived fields that are calculated based on other fields in the database. For instance, if the database includes a hectares field, but you want to display the data in square kilometers, you could use a derived or calculated field. It would be difficult to have a generic model that would allow editing in this case, because the model would have to know also how to back transform the value that you edited back to hectares before updating the database. And so QSQL query models are read only. But this would be a simple example of when you might want to create a custom model to implement that kind of functionality. QSQL table model descends from QSQL query model, and it provides an editable data model for an entire database table. Because it uses an entire table, there are no derived fields, and the generic data model can be edited. It's not as flexible as a model based on a SQL query, but it is editable. You can also, of course, hide some fields, and you can do some simple filtering as well if you don't want to display the entire table. QSQL Relational Table Model also provides an editable data model that is based on two joined tables. The QSQL Relational Table Model also provides an editable data model that is based on two joined tables. You have to specify in the model which fields the join is based on, and which type of join you want. You won't be working with QSQL relational table models in this class, but you should know that they exist. So hopefully by now you're starting to see the big picture of what a model is and how they can be used by a view to display data. But now we're going to get a little bit deeper into the weeds. One of the great things about a model is that many of them can populate themselves automatically. For instance, a Q file system model knows how to populate itself with data from your computer's file system. You just need to specify which directory to start with. All of the descendants of Q abstract table model also can populate themselves from a SQL select statement or from a database table. Other data models like Q standard item model require you to populate them manually. And this is normally done using the methods of the Q widget forms of item view classes. Another great thing about models is that the view widgets know how to use them. So if they can populate themselves and the views know how to use them, then you can imagine that the base functionality can be implemented very easily. You just create an instance of a data model and use the views setModel method to tell the view to use the model that you created 
and then everything else happens automatically. The Q abstract item model has some very useful methods. The index method takes a row and a column and a parent. And remember those three things are used to specify a specific item of data. And the index method returns an instance of the Q model index class that we can use to reference a specific data item. And we also have a set data method. And this takes a Q model index that specifies a specific data item that you want to set. And then you specify the value of the data that you want to set and also the role. We've talked about data roles previously when we talked about Qtree widgets and some of the other widget based classes. But basically each individual item in the model can have multiple data roles. One might be the string value that's actually displayed. Another might be the actual value from the database that's behind it. There might be a role, for instance, for a Q-tip that's displayed when you hover the mouse over that item. Maybe even a role for the color that the data is displayed in, in the view, and things like that. The setCurrentIndex method takes a QModel index and makes that the current index in the view. And the setRootIndex also takes a QModel index as a parameter, and it's used to specify where the view starts displaying data items. Because a model might be huge, it may contain a large amount of data, and you may want to display just a subset of that data in the view. For instance, your computer's file system might contain millions of files, but you just want to see the files that are in a certain directory. And you can set that directory using the set root index. You can sort a model by specifying a column and a sort order. And the sort order is an enum value. We've used that before. All models will have a row count and a column count. And this is important because it allows you to loop through the model. Remember with our index, we need row and column parameters. And if we have row count and column count, we can loop through the entire data model and access each individual item of data. Or you might want to just loop through a specific row or through a specific column. In the case of hierarchical models, we also have the has children method that returns true or false that we can use to check to see if there are any child items underneath a specific Q model index. And there are also methods to insert and remove rows and columns. So we've said the QModelIndex class provides access to an individual data item. And if you have an individual data item, you can get its row, its column, its parent. And if it has any siblings, you can also get the data that's associated with that model item. And in this case, you have to also specify the role of the data that you want to get returned. Again, this is most often the data that's being displayed in the view, and that's the default value. But as we said, there are other roles that can be associated with a specific model item. And this lecture is getting a little bit long, so I'm going to stop here. In the next lecture, we'll look at the Q file system model and some of its helper classes. And we'll dive right into some programming examples. And we'll see how easy it is to use these models with different views to examine your computer's file system. And we'll see you then.